Welcome. Um, I'm Dr. Keir Finlow Bates from Chain Frog, and uh, we're a new uh, Finnish computer software startup company, and we're uh, specialising in blockchains. Um, so we offer uh, some consultancy workshops. Uh, we're looking to collaborate on blockchain products and uh, projects, um, and uh, we've made a start already. We have uh, four patents pending at the moment, and some demo software that you can go and have a look at. Um, and that's why I think that we're uh, clued up about blockchains. So and I'd first I'd like to say thanks to the Tampere University of Technology, and particularly the Department of Pervasive Computing. When I first read that, I thought it said the Department of Persuasive Computing, <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, which, but this makes more sense. And particularly uh, Professor Yara Moharu and Kari uh, Susta and Tommy Mikkonen, who made this possible for us. Um, so let's kick off straight away with the question, what is a blockchain? And the really simple answer is, it's a database. It's a way of storing data records on a computer system. Um, but if we go a bit deeper, um, it's got to have some particular properties and some particular components uh, to qualify as a blockchain. Um, the first is, it needs to be running on a peer-to-peer -peer network, and hopefully you all know what a peer-to-peer -peer network is. Um, secondly, there has to be a blockchain file, and that's a, a serial file where data is added to the end over time. And blockchain files get bigger, they don't get smaller. Uh, the third thing is an agreed set of protocols. Um, so all the peers are running, they may be running different instances of software or software coded up in different languages, but they should all implement the same set of protocols. They should communicate in the same way. Um, and if something's been implemented incorrectly, that peer will basically not be allowed to join in with running the blockchain. And finally, it's a good idea to have a blockchain parser, something that allows you to run over this long file and actually extract the data and view it in a sensible way. So that's kind of an add-on part to blockchains. Um, let's see. So uh, I thought I'd start with a history lesson about databases. So in the 1960s, IBM introduced hierarchical databases. Um, you have sort of a node at the top, and the data is stored in a tree. Um, and it uh, was used for the Apollo um, project for getting a man on the moon. And they used it for uh, tracking components. Um, and IBM was doing quite well with databases. And then a guy called Edgar Frank Codd, who was working for IBM, published a paper on relational databases and the relational database model. Um, IBM decided not to pursue that, and they stuck with hierarchical databases. It's one example of IBM, unfortunately, not capitalizing on their own inventions. The uh, PC um, is another example, um, operating systems. You know, so they've got, had a history of not picking up that they had something good in their hands. Um, but they did catch up. But the first company to um, actually release a commercial relational database uh, was Oracle, although it was called uh, relational back then. And uh, Oracle and its founder, Larry Ellison, became very, very rich by selling these databases. Because relational databases are everywhere now. Um, so now we'll uh, zoom ahead to 2008, and a guy who called himself Satoshi Nakamoto published a white paper called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And in 2009, he released some software that implemented it. Uh, we don't know who he is, um, but his work's out there, and you can look that paper up on the internet and read it. And it's, it's not a bad paper, actually. It's only eight pages, and it really encapsulates all the core stuff of what a blockchain is. Um, I know a lot of uh, technical companies, they're now talking about blockchains. They don't like to mention Bitcoin because of its association with uh, sort of illegal drug trading and Ponzi schemes and um, scams and stuff. But the actual core ideas behind it and the technology is fine. It's just what some people did with it that has tarnished it. And I think it's important to look at, the, um, at Bitcoin because it's the first and longest running uh, uh, genuine blockchain. And we can learn a lot from it. Um, so now, 2016, uh, most databases are relational databases. Oracle, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, 
and IBN DB2 are the most popular ones out there. Um, there are lots of really good free open source ones like Postgres, and MySQL. Um, there are some commercial ones, a bit more expensive. Um, but basically, when someone talks about databases now, they are generally talking about a relational database. Um, like 95% of them, I think, are relational. Um, so one more lesson from history. In the early 80s, a uh, sales guy from a uh, relational database company would uh, go to another company and say, would you like to buy a, a database? And the uh, finance officer would say, well, why do I need a database? I've got a filing cabinet, I've got a secretary. Um, which now you know, <laughs> seems archaic, but that was how data was stored. Um, so the reason why I raise this is because the question being asked by some people now is, why do I need a blockchain? And I think there is a similar case to be made. Um, so I'm going to start off by looking at some of the weaknesses of databases in the light of the strengths of blockchains. Um, the thing about a relational database, it's, it's not necessarily a weakness. You may want to do this, but you can change records. And if you're an administrator, you can actually change the records and hide the fact that you changed them. Um, it's not a problem if you've got a database uh, which is a list of contacts that you care about. Somebody who you're no longer doing business with, you might want to delete them. You may not want to have your database cluttered up with all your old data. But there are cases where this is a, is a problem. Um, relational databases are designed around the concept of having a central server which runs the database and then clients connecting to it. Um, so it's a client-server model. And it's a model that serves us very well in the computer industry. Um, but it has meant that there are problems with backing up your database, synchronizing if you have multiple copies of the database, um, dealing with a case where you have multiple server farms running and people are editing the same record at the same time on different servers. And we've solved these problems by adding, bolting on extra software. Um, it's not, there's not anything intrinsic in the relational database model that allows you to cope with all these issues. Um, and then I stuck up a cartoon by a cartoonist that I like very much, um, XKCD, where um, someone has named their child with an SQL string. And as a result, when the school puts his name in their database, it actually causes the database to delete all the records. Um, if they would used the blockchain, that wouldn't have happened. So. OK, so a blockchain is a, a method of storing data in a sequential chain of blocks. You create blocks at a regular interval. Um, and each block has a hash, which is like a fingerprint that describes that block. And um, each sequential block refers to the block before it. Um, actually, I've got a diagram here that. Uh, Explains that. So you create a first block of data, you put some records in it maybe, and then at a certain time later you create another block and you include in that block a hash of the previous block and you just keep building up this chain. And what happens here is that um, as the chain gets longer, it gets harder and harder and then eventually impossible to change earlier blocks. If you were to pull out block B3, for example, and swap it, then its hash would change. And so block B4 would no longer refer correctly back to it. Um, so you would have to change block B4. But then block B4's has would change. So you would have to change block B5. And if there's a million blocks, that means you have to change a million blocks, um, which would take a lot of effort. Um, so that's how a blockchain file stops um, people from tampering with it. Um, so the next question I think needs answering is, how do you add blocks to a blockchain? Um, and I talked about the peer-to-peer -peer network earlier. Um, some of the devices on the network are just going to transmit the data that they want to be included. Um, and then other devices on the network package that data up into a block. And the whole network basically holds a lottery to see which of the devices packaging data into blocks is lucky enough to get their block added onto the end of the chain. Um, and the reason why people run these computers to generate these blocks is because if your block is picked, it being a lottery, you win a prize. Um, 
Or in some cases, if it's like a, a blockchain that's being run by a company, well, they will just run it because the blockchain has value to them. They don't actually have to run a lottery system. They can use another mechanism. But, but Bitcoin uses this mechanism. Um, so the idea is that the blocks are added at a regular interval, roughly. Um, and you do this by adjusting the odds of winning the lottery. Um, Bitcoin does it uh, so that a block is added on average every 10 minutes. And these lottery methods, uh, proof of work is the one used by Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum, which is another popular blockchain, uh, is currently using proof of work, but is intending to move to proof of stake. And I'll uh, explain why later. Um, then another couple of uh, blockchain systems, Fabric and Sawtooth Lake, use uh, something called practical Byzantine fault tolerance. And we'll touch on the word Byzantine later. And finally, uh, Sawtooth Lake uses something called proof of elapsed time. But they're basically all schemes to ensure, uh, to find a way of picking whose block gets added next. Okay. Um, so there are, in my opinion, three types of blockchain. This is, there's a bit of a debate going on. Some people are purists and say only the one on the top line here is a genuine blockchain. Um, however, industry is actually more interested in the middle and the bottom line. Um, so you could have a public blockchain where everything is out in the open, it's run on the internet, the specific, uh, the protocol uh, is uh, published, and uh, the software is freely available. And that's what Bitcoin uses. You could use it for a global share trading platform. Um, you could use it for a passport system, and there's a group of people running something called BitNation that are pushing for this idea. Um, you could use it for a public review and reputation system where people can review restaurants or products or something and put those reviews on the blockchain and then everybody else can see them. And the uh, manufacturers of the product or the owners of the restaurant can't go in and tamper with the, uh, the record. Um, so a permission blockchain uh, would probably be accessed on the internet or on some kind of more open network. Uh, but uh, the access would be through keys that are issued by a central authority or by a group. Um, they have a use if you have a consortium of companies that want to share data in a, in a database um, and they don't want one company to own it. So that uses there might be um, you have smart meters checking on power consumption and you have multiple billing and admin companies. Um, when a consumer switches from one billing company to another, uh, the data is still available and the, the new company doesn't have to extract it from the old one. Um, and then finally, private blockchains, that's where a company runs it in-house. Um, you can't log into it unless you're um, fully authorized to. Uh, which could be used for things like uh, notarizing when uh, your company invented something. Uh, HR could use it to create permanent records of who started working at the company, what their salaries were when they left. Um, and it could be used for legal compliance. The company, when being audited by an outsider, could say, well, here's our blockchain. You can run your parser over it, and you end up with an audit report. And you know that we can't have tampered with it because it would take decades of computer power to, to make a fake chain. Okay. Um, so then I think the question is, where would you use a blockchain and where would you use a relational database? And we've already touched on the integrity of data records. I think that's the main selling point of blockchains, is that the, uh, the data has integrity. Um, it doesn't on a relational database unless you are really careful in how it's set up and how it's audited. Um, We've discussed location, that blockchain uh, is stored across many machines. They can be fairly low powered, uh, whereas uh, the database is usually stored on a central server. Um, the uh, speed, well, here you have a weakness of blockchains. They um, take minutes to add data. It's basically how you set it up. Um, it may be possible in the future to make uh, blocks appear at a very, very rapid rate, but I don't think that's feasible at the moment. Um, and then there's another issue of trust. So later on, I'll be talking about this proof of work algorithm and how it actually creates trust between entities using the system. You don't, um, you don't have to 
trust the other entities using the uh, blockchain system, the uh, blockchain makes sure that the transactions are above board and irreversible and auditable. Um, on a database, the trust depends on uh, the reliability of the database owner. Um, you know, you may be storing some of your data on Google um, or Microsoft databases, and maybe that's because you trust those companies. Maybe you see an interesting-looking product. Um, I saw one for tracking my uh, kids' location uh, using their phones, where it got written. And then I looked at the company, and I thought, I have no idea whether this is a reputable company or whether it's just two guys in a garage in Colorado um, running a server. Um, you know, so trust on a, a relational database depends on who's running it. Um, so an advantage of relational databases, they've been around for uh, a long time, you know, 45 years now. Um, whereas blockchains, they're still evolving and there's a lot of debate and discussion going on. On the plus side, for researchers, there's a lot of opportunity for exploring new ideas and uses of technology. Um, and then cost, uh, at the moment, because they're new, if you want to use a blockchain, it's going to cost you in terms of getting an engineer who actually knows how they function. Whereas databases, they can generally be rolled out fairly easily. Um, for niche purposes, it may be expensive. Um, right. Uh, let's uh, touch on a charging model. So an advantage of a uh, blockchain is that it comes with a folded-in form of a currency or a token system. It doesn't have to be a cryptocurrency where you're actually trading something that you hope to eventually be able to sell for, uh, for dollars. You could build a token system to uh, limit people's access or uh, give people more access. So, you know, you want to use the blockchain um, put lots of data on it, we'll charge you more tokens, and maybe those tokens have to be bought. But basically, there's, it's very easy to add a charging model into a blockchain, whereas with a database, it requires a custom system. Um, and then we have uh, collaboration. I think we sort of discussed that a bit under trust before. Um, now, I put here that uh, blockchain is green for collaboration and red for databases. You can hack blockchains if the implementation is poor. Uh, that's a problem with any cryptographic system. Um, or if you've chosen bad keys, then the system may be robust, but your particular use of it may not be. Um, but with uh, relational databases, we already covered uh, SQL injection attacks, for example. There's, um, they weren't initially designed to be secure. And as a result, they have weaknesses.